And I knew our people are very generous. They didn't care if the refugees from Kosovo were Muslim or whatever religion they were. They wanted to help. We collected about 20, 25,000 pounds in cash and coins. Wow. Imagine, imagine how many buckets that is. And then when a disaster struck, I'll be leaving my jaw, me and my rucksack. My mother used to keep saying like, Punjabi, like, leave it, are you going to change it all yourself? And I'll say, yeah, I'm going to change it myself. In the last 10 years, we had great trustees, we got great volunteers. I mean, that's the key. I always write in my post, our volunteers are our heroes. We worked in about 50 countries so far. We've been at risk, we nearly got killed or hurt. I wouldn't change anything, it's been a great journey. Welcome to the Bay HQ podcast, where we inspire, connect and guide the next generation of British Asians. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button. And if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, make sure you give us a five-star review. Today we have with us Ravi Singh, who's an international humanitarian and the CEO and founder of Carcerate. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm good, man. Thanks for coming over and uh, doing this show. And like, thank you for letting us come to your offices today as well. It's like, been amazing. You can see people watching this and they've seen the previous episodes. Then we've got a completely different background today. Yep. yep. So there's, no. there's a green screen back here, which I hope is going to be cut out, but... We'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, next one, we're dark green or light green colour, so my head disappears. <laughs> yeah. yeah, originally you had a green uh, exactly, blue exactly. sun, right? Exactly, just floating. We, yeah, next time we'll do that, we'll just have a floating head. Me yeah, and conversation. exactly, yeah. might be interesting. But yeah, thanks for coming over. And there's always tea and coffee for 50p each. So, you know, <laughs> take, take advantage. Yeah, you've got to pay okay. on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you won't leave without paying, trust me. Yeah. But... <laughs> we won't let you leave. No, it's really good to see everyone. So thanks for that. Especially, uh, you know, this is so. You know, this sort of podcast really helps to inform the public on many issues. So thanks for doing that. There's actually like five people in the room today who are semi-related yeah. to me as well. Yeah. So this is an episode that everybody wanted to come and watch in person. So we've got we have an audience here as well. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, I'm uh, really pleased to meet the audience. It's good to see that my live recording is being so closely monitored right next <laughs> to me. It's like somebody sitting with a prodding stick. Don't say that, don't do that. <laughs> but they didn't. So if you rewind back to the story of like where this all started from, like where did Carcerade begin? Or what was the origin story? Yeah, it started in uh, 1999 during uh, the 300 years celebration of the Khalsa. As you know, we do Nagar Kirtans throughout the world. And there's so much longer. So we said, look, there's a war going on in Kosovo. There are people fighting, watching the news. I remember watching the news, a little cubby hole. And the guys inside the room were throwing bread, like hundreds of hands were trying to catch one loaf of bread. And so I spoke to my friends, I said, look, we've got Langar here. That's what Langar is about. We should go and do something. And it was a real, like, so for us, an eye opener, uh, eye opener as well. We've never done anything like it. It was, like, amazing, especially going outside Slough for us it was a big deal. You know, we're not used to leaving our beloved Slough. And then the uh, next day was Nagar Kirtan in Slough. I think it's about 4th of April. Uh, 1999, and uh, I was uh, preparing one of the trucks for the Nagar Kirtan in, on a Saturday evening for the following day, and I was talking to myself what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, and I remember thinking of, thinking of the name, and I said, okay, Khalsa, Khalsa Aid, and also there's something I've got to add on to that, that after 1984, anything with the word Khalsa, a name or concept, we became like labeled by the Indian government as terrorists. I knew a lot of people that turned back from European airports with the name Khalsa. So we wanted to bring that concept back, that Khalsa is the ultimate humanitarian. So we called it Khalsa Aid. And the next day, spoke to our friends and they all agreed, let's go and do something. And you know, rest is history where we are today, 23 years later. Did you ever think that would be like your life's work from that first day? I knew from the response we had that in one day alone at Nagarki in Southall, we collected about 20, 25,000 pounds in cash and coins. Wow. Imagine, imagine how many buckets that is. And I knew our people are very generous. They didn't care if the refugees from Kosovo were Muslim or whatever religion they were. They wanted to help. I was asked the same question actually by a, a journalist. Do you see Carl Said as like the Red Cross? And I remember at the time I said it'd probably be beyond that. And uh, in, the, in the trust of people, you know, the, being a very uh, organization they can donate to, we've become very, very, I think, above many organizations, larger organizations. So, yeah, we did have a vision that eventually we will be global and that other people will join in. So, yeah, we are where we thought we'd be, but didn't think it would be this much love, though, from the Sangha. And, like, 
Did you straight away go into it full time or how did that work? Because you must be doing something before that. Yeah, well. yeah, it was the, those were the tough years that nobody wants to talk about. <laughs> we'll see a mission, you know, we, I'll be working. I was working around, I think, Edgeway Road for um, an Arabic guy, you know, a really nice guy helping out. And then when a disaster struck, I'll be leaving my job, me and my rucksack. Then one or two would join in, mostly like Somalia and some of the mission I went on my own. And Congo, we had somebody else in 2003, uh, who's a Amrik Singh, who's a Sikh mm -hmm. chaplain at the Heathrow Airport. And then other people joined in. And uh, in those days, there was no health and safety, no risk assessments. You just get on a plane and see what you can do. I remember my mother used to keep saying, like, uh, in Punjabi, like, leave it, are you going to change it all yourself? And I'll say, yeah, I'm going to change it myself. I think one of the trips was 2003 Somalia. I didn't tell her I was going. Because if I told her I was going, she wouldn't stop calling me, telling me for the last four or five days, don't go. It's very dangerous. You know, don't go alone. So I went to Somalia. And that was a journey. That was a very difficult journey in a strange way. And I remember using the only phone in that little village to say in Punjabi, oh, I'm in Somalia. I'll call you back soon when I can get another phone. She goes, Somalia, where's that? And I said, it's a country. He goes, oh, you've gone already. I told you before, don't go. And the phone cut off. And uh, so there, from there onward, I would tell her when I landed. Even now, for me, I don't see anything dangerous because just the way I am. But we got staff, we got volunteers. You can't do the same thing now. You can't put someone in a rucksack with a rucksack and say, go into in a war zone or go into a disaster area where you, know, you don't know anyone. For me, I'm still 23 years later, the same thing. As soon as my doctors give me a go-ahead after my transplant, I can travel. I'll be setting up new operations. That's what I love doing. Did, were you ever scared at all, like when you're going to like, Somalia, for example? Because I guess most people listening have only heard about it from like the news or from like films. And obviously, it's not really a tourist destination. No, you have to be a bit crazy. I mean, there was a movie out, which I didn't see before I went. I saw it afterwards. It was exactly like the movie in Norway. Uh, you, you have to... I remember one of our trustees' brother lives in Nairobi. And there's a place in Nairobi that you buy your, you don't buy the ticket, you just pay someone. Like the local mafia, you could say. <laughs> they, they have these like uh, bags of, big bag of drugs, the green called Chart or Mira, which is illegal here. And I think legal in some of the countries, which is grown in Kenya, sold in Somalia. And uh, that's the plane that takes them. So the only way you can go there was jump on that, in that small plane, which isn't very bigger than a house. <laughs> And then you just sit on top of the top of the bags uh, of this weed or whatever you want to call it. And it's only you and the pilot, maybe one other right tucked in the back. That's it. And I wasn't really scared, but the guy, his brother, uh, Satnam Singh in Kenya, all night before I traveled, first said, don't go to this area in Nairobi to buy the ticket. It's like real maze. I remember these ways to get the ticket. And then to... Uh, to somebody he goes, oh, don't go, they'll murder you, they'll get butchered. And then it was a journey and a half. I mean, I, I wasn't scared. I was still, this day, I have faith in people. You're gonna, somebody's going to shoot, they're going to shoot you. But not every person's bad, not every person's good. But if you think, you know, if in the perception, like, for instance, in the Middle East would be, the Middle East would be, oh, Iraq, oh, my God, they're going to kill you. Somalia, oh, my God. No, they're normal people. Yeah, there are elements. They may want to harm you, but it's, you, you can't lose faith in humanity. As soon as you lose faith in humanity, you will get scared, you'll get frightened, and you can't go anywhere. Because we interviewed um, Navdeep Singh a couple of days ago, and he talks about how in the early stages where it took a long time to kind of really get yeah. going and like you were sharing tables and things. Can you talk about those times as well of trying to get more people involved in the community? Yeah, I mean, that was a real struggle. Uh, I remember going 5.30 in the morning to Birmingham, to Coventry, wherever there was a Nagar Kirtan, to set up a stall. You're trying to beg and borrow a table from a gurdwar or something, and you probably won't be forthcoming. People didn't know really who we were. Uh, important thing to know, there was no social media for the first eight years, eight, nine years. We'd done it just word of mouth. So it was built real, like, raw grit. So even now you get that, because politics in Punjab, they take politics in some of the gurdwaras here. If politicians don't like you back home, they won't let you speak on stages here. It's happening all the time here. So, yeah, it was a difficult time. It was like a real hands-on, you know, put some posters the night before in the morning, A4, stick it on some piece of paper somewhere or on a board saying, this is what we do. 
and uh, trying to get a bucket to collect funds, and you, you know, you're doing your jobs at the same time. Like I talked about before, you know, you're running around, you're giving up your time, and then you're doing this. So 10 years, it was like the balancing act. And when did you take it full time, where you gave up your job um, and this was your full time gig? 2000, late 2008. And I remember we took an office in big, big yellow office in Slough. And our IT guy, the same guy, he said, we need to write a website. I said to my wife, I said, I'm going to live, I'm going to use all my savings, and then I'll see if I take a salary. So after 10 years, in early 2009, I took a huge cut from what I was doing. I used all my savings for three months, and then I had no money left. I started taking a very low salary. I think it was about 19 or 20,000. Then started uh, writing the website, what we're doing, what we're not doing, then somebody checking it. And yeah, so from that day, we've really not looked back because this being full-time, I could do more. Uh, but again, you need a team around you. You need to, somebody to book your tickets. You need, we, we had some people helping us. We had my wife, who was instrumental in a lot of the support. I, uh, even today, I can't go online with anything. I can't even buy anything online. I'm so useless. <laughs> so people were helping from 2005 onwards. My friend Jitinder Singh, Jindi, who's, in, who's now the Canada director, he was instrumental. There's so many individuals that really helped in the beginning. And, and then after 2010, Haiti earthquake, it just organization just became well known. So it obviously must have been quite a big decision to take it full time because you're doing it on the side for a long time. You're doing all these crazy trips set all over the world. What made you think that this is now the right time? Uh, we, have a cho- we had a choice. Uh, we had a lot of support from the community to do the project. We, by then, we've done several projects, big ones like Pakistan earthquake, the tsunami, and people started supporting Carl Said. So the decision was made, I said, either we take it full time now and grow it or keep it where it is and just do what we're doing. So I said, no, we're going to grow the organization. So, yeah, have to take a huge pay cut, save, use the savings. And next thing you know, we're on full time and here we are today. It's just an amazing journey. And how did you start organizing it and scaling it then, right? Because it's different when you had the freedom to like, you're just going to jump on a plane. But like I said, now you've got volunteers and people like that. You can't just tell them to like jump on a plane to a war zone, you've nope. got to health and safety. How did that kind of now, thing well, well, now, like now, 23 years later, I mean, or the last 10 years, we have to make sure this is a risk assessment. And most of our staff who are active in the field and active key volunteers, about five or 10 of them, they all have to attend a three-day hostile training course, which is given to journalists working in war zone. It's basically things like, you know, you're in a war zone, you're in a hostile territory, you had a flat tire, how are you going to deal with it? You come under fire or you've been shot. Or, you know, something terrible has happened, how are you going to deal with it? It's a three-day very intense training. We do that. We have to have special insurance. And we have to have a tracking. I have to track the person where they are every two hours in case we don't hear from them. We know roughly where they are the last time we spoke to them. So it's, it's a lot of work in what people see the end. Somebody delivering aid. But then when we get to the country, we have to negotiate with the contractors, with the suppliers, you know, different language, different uh, culture. So it's a, it's a lot of logistics involved. And like, for people who don't know, what's the kind of scale of Kaos right now? Like how many volunteers have you got? How many people go on these different missions? Put it this way, we've, I think we've worked in about 50 countries so far. Live missions, which is a clean water campaign in Kenya, Malawi, Zambia, Gambia. And we're expanding that project. We've got stuff going on in Ukraine still uh, and in Poland for the Ukrainian IDPs. We've got massive Langare team in the, in the UK, which is in Coventry run by Indajit Singh and of Darkur, and where they provide hot meals every evening to about 150 people, no questions asked, collect the hot meals. And they provide breakfast for the kids who can't afford breakfast at home. And they also uh, help the vulnerable and the homeless. Around the world, yeah, Ukraine, India's huge projects. We continue to expand the projects in Punjab and the rest of India. So, and, uh, you know, there are, there's so many more that we're, we're planning ahead. And this is always something in 24 hours a day is always something we're doing. There's not the day that we're not doing anything. And what's been the hardest thing about trying to manage all of those different projects? We've got a great team. We've got an absolutely wonderful team. In the last 10 years, we had great tr- trustees. We've got great volunteers. I mean, that's the key. I always write in my post, our volunteers are our heroes. And like Indy Hothi, like, you know, he was, he was a, yeah, he remembers he was a boy, Indy Hothi, when we went to Kosovo. He remembers the trucks going, we couldn't understand what it was. And then he became a trustee. Then he became somebody who consults us on, on, on a lot of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, volunteers, I mean, are amazing. So the team, the team speaks for itself. 
if we didn't have a good team, we wouldn't do anything. We got absolutely wonderful team. Is there anything you've started doing today that you wish you did earlier on? Because you mentioned earlier on how the website came about eight years into like Carl's Raid's life to mm-hmm. really expand the reach and the impact you did. Maybe I should have covered my beard a bit earlier, but it's a bit <laughs> late now. No, I mean, it's been a journey where you're building, you're always moving forward. There's always things you can improve on. There's nothing that you can't improve on. I mean, I wish we had social media earlier, which we didn't. I wish, you know, some people have a lot of big media teams following them around. Hundreds of pictures a day, they keep publishing. You know, I, I am the social media guy. That's it, that's me. I do all the social media with help from now. Aman helps us post some stuff. Uh, we kept it very minimal on the media side, but something different. I don't know. I think I would do the same thing again. Even the countries where we, you know, we're being at risk, we nearly got killed or hurt. Don't think anything. I wouldn't I would change anything. It's been a great journey. And what are the challenges you have now? Uh, identity. When we work in places like Iraq, Syria borders, in uh, 2014 when ISIS was on the rise, the Yazidi community and the Assyrian Christians uh, were struggling and were attacked by ISIS. We went to help. I remember I was there on my own first time with the locals in uh, northern Iraq. And the people were just, there was nothing there. Like you could say 10 football grounds, absolutely des- des- deserted. Next thing you know, it's, it's 50 degrees temperature and you're watching waves of heat waves and people suddenly appearing. Thousands of people become refugees. Identity was they thought the elders of the Yazidi people said, we don't want to talk to this guy because he represents ISIS, the beard and turban. Mm-hmm. So I was wearing very colorful turbans from that day onwards. I never wore a black to, or a white turban to uh, Iraq then, always this sort of turquoise or something like. And that day I was wearing a royal blue. And the elders found me. And luckily I had a local guy with me. He's still a friend of mine, uh, Allah. And the uh, elders started pointing fingers at Allah. And I said, oh, something's upset them. I said, what's happening? Allah? He goes, no, don't worry. They don't understand. I said, no, no, tell me. I don't want to hurt their sentiment. He goes, the color you're wearing is the color. It was the banners that attacked our people about a few hundred years ago. And this is the 74th genocide, by the way, these people. He goes, they were carrying those colors. That's why they find it offensive. I said, that's fine. I won't wear it again. I have no idea. I'll tell them I apologize. And then next thing, I wouldn't wear that royal blue again. So these sort of things, I mean, you know, I can list so many more. How do you build trust with these people as well? You've got to do the work. Uh, a lot of people uh, turn up and just take a few pictures, drop a couple of bags of food, and they never come back in. We promised them. Uh, there was an old man in Iraq, because I got a picture. Since 2015, I've known him. Every time I go back, Susan Farmi is our young inspirational lady in Iraq. She's a Kurdish young lady, been helping us. Since he was 19, now she's a, a director there. This old man grabbed me by the hands. He was very elderly. He had like a big beard, like a turban. He said, please, please don't leave my people. Don't leave us. That was 2015. I said, I promise you, we'll never leave you. There was a lot of pictures with me every time I go, videos. Sadly, he passed away last year. But we never let go of him, his family, or his people in those camps. We're still there for them. But I'm so glad that we kept the promise. So we don't just say... We'll, we'll do it and then walk away. We then follow it through. That's how you build the trust. Those women, Azidi women, the world's forgotten, thousands were captured and taken slaves by ISIS. And they were kept as sex slaves, they were sold, raped, abused. And um, they trust most of the organization called Said. They said, you never stopped helping us. So when if any of you guys go on a mission with us, especially young ladies, they want to open up. They want to tell the world because people's forgotten. The world's forgotten. So the trust being built through work, through support, through uh, continuous intervention. Maybe somebody's hungry, somebody uh, needs whatever they need, the tent's blown away or caught fire, we'll replace it straight away. When you've seen so much pain like that, because obviously in this country, we, we see pain from different people. We don't see that level where people have been taken as slaves and that kind of thing or in our daily lives. How do you keep your positive mindset? You said you've got so much faith in humanity. How do you maintain that when you've seen some of these tragedies. In 2015, the BBC made a documentary called The Selfless Seek, Faith on the Front Line. We were recording with the, uh, the camera person and director, which is uh, Sharon. Susan was translating as a lady we were interviewing. She escaped from ISIS and she had three kids. She's talking, they were like, I think five, six, or and then maybe a 40 year old baby. And the guy who captured her killed all three of them. And she, the way he did it, She's explained to it on the film. He gave something to them, could be poison. They came shaking from somewhere outside. Even the baby was shaking. The next day, never woke up. What really hit us was when she showed the picture of dead babies. You said, oh my God, you never get over it. 
you see it again and again. But the mind, your brain is so strong, it's unbelievable. I talk about it, it comes back to me, but it locks it up. Your mind protects you. You've seen so many bad stuff. You've seen in Pakistan earthquake, people trapped in buildings, it's been raining. You try to rescue them while they pull the limbs, come off. It's like, it's, it's just, you know, this is real life. There's no, you can't gloss it over. You can't suddenly make it into some sort of romantic Bollywood movie because this is, this is life. In Orissa, 1999 cyclone, we went in January 2020. Yeah, January 2000. Our millennium was on the field. And next day, walking in the field, this whole families were tied to each other, men, women, children, and they're dead, face down or face up. And I'm thinking, so I asked the guy, how come? He goes, when the cyclone came, there was nothing here. The water just suddenly came like 13, 14, 15 foot. They were drowning. So they tied themselves to each other and the tree. But the tree got rooted, they all drowned. And the bodies were still lying in the fields. So, but, you know, you, you get motivated to do more. These are the things that drive you. They might have passed away. You can still do more. So, but you do when you think about it, reflect on it. Some of the things you see, you do get shaken, you do get upset. But then, honestly, the mind, it just locks it away until you talk about it, which is very strange. And if people listening now, right, they might want to do something to help, but they're not sure how to do it. What would you advise them? Because like you said, it's always more that can be done. There's always different people in this world who are being mm. overlooked. What can they do? I think it starts at home first. You know, start in the community. You could be living in any town in, in the UK or a city or anywhere in the world. Start looking at who's suffering in your town. The elderly, like now we've got a very cold spell. Your neighbours. Join in the homeless sports centres. Volunteer your time. Carl said it's just one organisation. There's loads to do locally. Sometimes we want to reach out for the stars when we don't miss, we don't see what's next door to us. There's so much. And one thing I, I'm i proud to say that in, since 1999, the biggest achievement being that we have a whole generation who grew up with Carl Said and grew up with, as humanitarians watching it. And that's what we need to be. We need to be more tolerant. In a world where we judge people, there's so much hate, you know, judging someone by their faith. Even on refugees, there's, there's hate. You know, we welcome certain refugees they can stay longer than you want. Other refugees, we don't want them here. And yet we say, no, no, well, refugees are welcome as long as they're this color or as long as they fit into our society. A refugee is a refugee. A refugee is someone who's going through absolute heartache, hardship, leaving everything behind. and They need help. And then if you imagine I start judging people saying, I don't need to you know, support you, you're this and you're that. So my message to the young, especially the younger generation is, Always be tolerant. Remember our fathers, forefathers came here, they suffered the same abuse, the same BS that, you know, these people are next, might be next door, maybe a refugee family next door, maybe a refugee family on your road, maybe somebody getting abused for their gender, or whatever. You gotta speak up. We got social media. I don't see why people don't. You got, you got, you got no excuse now. In the old days, we had this excuse, we don't know who to talk to. Now you put a post up, it goes viral. So if you wanna build a better world for yourself and your kids, you got to start being tolerant. You got to be that change. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And I guess on the other side, so we talked about some of the tragedies you've seen, but you must have seen such amazing generosity as well. When you've been to some of these places where people are struggling, but they're still helping each other out and still looking after each other, have you got any great stories oh, about I mean, that? It's, it's everywhere. Everywhere you go, people like in. I remember going to Lebanon, Iraq, all the refugee camps, and you know we're passing a camp or a tent or something, and the family say, "No, no, no, please." You have to have tea with us. And you know, they've got nothing. And they want to share tea and biscuits with you. And uh, the Yazidi family in Iraq, I remember giving water, we're distributing water in a very hot summer, clean water. And the guy says, is that water clean, brother? Because I don't think it's clean. So I put the post on my mouth, start drinking the water. He's like covered in water. I said, what do you think? He said, oh, my God. He goes, come, please, you have to eat with us. You have to, they've made some bread and stuff and tea. People are very generous. People are very generous, even when they got nothing. I think people who got least are the most generous. Sometimes you have more, you're less generous because you want to keep building more. Generosity, you know, I always say people are good. Generally, people are good. But unfortunately, we judge it by a few, few idiots, basically. So, yeah, this, you know, we escaped death and we're saved by certain people. We're here because somebody stood for us and we didn't ask for their color. Or, you know, it's the same in life. If somebody saves you from getting mugged or beaten in the street or whatever, what are you going to say? You say, oh, no, you're a Christian, you're a Muslim, you're a Hindu, you can't save me, I don't like you guys. No, you're going to take the help. And then you're going to realize life is a bit short to be in, living in hate. So if, if you can accept the help, you can also give it. We're very quick to judge. You know, We'll take something from you, but later on to give, oh, no, I don't like that guy. Hang on, you weren't very quick saying that when you needed something. 
So this is the world we live in. You've got to make it a better place. It's like what we see a lot in the UK, right? Where there's so many doctors from immigrant backgrounds. Yeah, of course. And, and they people, get abused. Yeah, and they get abused. And it's like, well, they're saving your life. But sometimes people don't see that. And it's just a shame that there's so many people out there doing great stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful stuff. It's, you know, for me, especially the NHS, uh, during my transfer and after, I can't be thankful enough for the nurses. We've got absolute angels in the NHS, amazing surgeons. So it's not just saying we're the only ones, we're doing no. They're absolutely great organisations, doing absolutely wonderful work all over the world. Choose the one you like to work with. And you've had some struggles, obviously, in some different countries and like, with governments and things like that. How do you try to manage that? Because it must be so disheartening to know that you're trying to do something to help and the organisation is going to help people in need. But then politics gets in the way. Like, how do you try to manage that? It happens mostly only in India, where we're treated suspiciously, we treat it with, in a way, disdain. Most of the countries I worked in, they welcome you in. So I don't... And also, we work, we're trying to work with local organizations, like the Rotary Clubs, Lions Clubs. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'd like to give a big shout-out to the Lions Club uh, in the uh, Andaman Islands that helped us. And now other Lions Clubs and Rotary Clubs helping us, even in Madagascar and all that. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's teamwork. With all the places you've been to, has there been anywhere that surprised you where you had a certain stereotype or idea of what the people would be like there. And when you actually got there, it's totally different to what you I, I don't really have stereotypes. I mean, that's what I get from my family and some of my friends. I mean, some of my family and friends that they may build something. Like, for instance, like I said, if you're going to Africa or Middle East, oh, my God, it's so dangerous. No, it's not dangerous. It's, there are parts mm-hmm. dangerous and there are people who are, some people who are bad. Not everyone's bad. I think generally it's your attitude as well. Mm-hmm. Your attitude. But I remember certain things in life, certain things in my journey, you know, some that really stick out, if you want to say a couple of those things. One was in 1999 when we launched Carl Said, and we were in the Kosovan Albanian border in the town called Kukus, you know, the mountains. And we had some food and clothing left over, our personal stuff. So we said, Tony was driving my van. Uh, he passed away, he's such a nice guy, through cancer, unfortunately. So we tied bundles, but you can't distribute slowly because you got mobbed. So what we'll do, I'll go in the back of the van, bundle up some, some food, Punjabi food, mutri and all this stuff, people know what that means, and then snacks, and we'll identify someone, and then Tony will pull up, and I'll run, drop it to them, and run off before you get mobbed, because that's what happens, people are hungry. I remember doing this one group of people, pack the bag, uh, the clothing, with extra clothing, or some spare clothing. I ran towards these three people sitting on the, on the edge. It's freezing cold, by the way, winter. And as I dropped the, the bag into the lady, I looked up, she's about 80-something, very leathery face, wearing a, like a black hijab. And next to her was a guy about 40, shaking. He wasn't well, as he was blind. And then her husband, what looks like a husband. And he was really unwell, the son. She grabbed me like this in her hands, like holding me like this. And she just looked through me. I was just looking through her. What sounded like, seems like eternity, it was like probably 30, 40 seconds. And she came down to do this and this. This is, a, this is a Muslim lady from Albania, from Kosovo. They had nothing. They were freezing. And she was blessing for that bundle of whatever. She didn't know what was in there. But she wouldn't let go. But sound, honestly, it was like, I still remember that face. I still remember it. I still remember the sun shaking. He was blind. He wasn't well. I, went, I hope he was well at the end. And I remember in Somalia, when Lende went to a chief's house in the middle of nowhere. And... Um, Chief's wife was elderly, elderly woman. He was elderly. And it was, I felt, I said, wow. She goes to me, she was translating through this guy. She goes, oh, you left your mother in a faraway land to help us here. And then she had a maternal sign. Like, she went like this. She goes, I am your mother here. Like, and I felt like, wow. I said, I've come all this way. And this woman's given me so much love that I am your mother here. That's the sign they make, like, I'm your mother. And I was like, quite tight. There's so many things that happen. You know, so that's, we don't judge anyone. Somalia is a very tough place to live in. Any country that's got war is a tough place to live in. So judging or stereo- stereotyping just isn't in me. So like, I've loved this conversation. You've always been somebody that I've looked up to as well. So it's quite surreal for me to even sit here and have this conversation. And I'm sure many people listening have got the same attitude yeah. as well if they've heard about your work. But we've got to move on to the quick fire questions for the, the yeah, end sure, of sure. So the first quick fire question is, who are three British stations that you think are doing great work that you think people listening right now should be following? And learning from and I know this is a hard question for you it's a tough very tough question really tough 
And also, uh, we're forcing him to say free people, so nobody get annoyed at him. Yeah, don't get annoyed <laughs> at me, because I'm trying to think, there's so many good people out there, that's the problem. And if I miss somebody out, they're going to get really annoyed. So I said, three most recent people, let's say, something like that. Or you've talked in the last week, maybe. My wife's ringing my ear, she rings me all the time, so I'm <laughs> here, I know. Oh, my God. Can we come back to that? Yeah, we can come back to that okay. afterwards. So okay. we do that other two first, right? That's a very difficult question, you know that. Put me on the hot seat. Send me to Syria, Iraq. Don't ask this question. <laughs> so what, the other one is, if people listen right now, they want to reach out to you and reach out to Castrade, what can they reach out to you about? What should they get in contact you, with you about? They can talk to me about anything. When I'm shopping, even last night I was shopping in the local Sainsbury's, people approach, people ask questions, I welcome it. We are here because of the Sangat, because of the public. I'm not shy about talking. I share my number. If there's any emergency, they can approach about anything. You know, if there's anything we can do, we'll do. If we can't, we can't. I'm always up for a coffee and a chat. Always open, approachable, no issues about anything. And then on the other side, what's something you need help with at the moment? What could somebody be we, We're always looking for good volunteers, qualified volunteers, people who can help uh, keep the charity uh, going, moving forward and volunteer their time in either helping in the office, organizing events, or, or, or traveling abroad eventually once they um, uh, spent six months helping us in the office. So we're always looking for volunteers. So we're going to have to come back to the first question again now. Are you ready? Mm. That's the hardest question <laughs> ever, man. I can talk like a machine gun all day about that question. I'm trying to think now. All right, well, we'll name them. Yes, that's your fault. Okay, uh, so the three people, one, one of the organization, which I quite like in Scotland, the Sikh Food Bank. And they're doing absolutely wonderful in Scotland. People, that, those people should be supported. And uh, you've got, uh, uh, I'll be a bit biased, our Langaraid guys in the Coventry. So if you follow Langaraid, especially with the cost of living crisis, they're doing amazing work in Coventry, especially feeding the vulnerable and the homeless. Uh, amazing work. Top of that, you've got oh, my brother Randir from uh, Middle Langa Seva. They're doing good stuff as well. So yeah, so the Sikh Food Bank in Scotland, the Midland Langer Seva guys and the Langer A team in Coventry. So inspiring because they're doing so much work day and night. Perfect. So it's been great to chat to you. And the final question is, have you got any final words for the audience? My, my message remains always the same. You know, honestly, there's, it's not even about money. It's not even about any riches or power. Uh, and I strongly believe, I said it before, especially in our community, we got a lot of domestic violence issues. We got drink problems. We got problems that people don't want to talk about. They want to hide it under the sweep under the carpet. Talk about those problems. Talk about mental illness, mental mental health. Mental health is very important. My brother's been sectioned, and I remember people trying to suppress that. So talk about mental health. Talk about domestic abuse. And if you are suffering from domestic abuse, speak up. Speak out loud. You know, especially like also alcohol problems. We we want to bury it like we're whiter than white we're not we got issues as a community and we need to speak them speak about them for me mental health would be the top of that if you're a young person girl boy whatever just talk talk to anybody don't keep it inside and whatever you do don't take any steps that will hurt your family or yourself always talk thank you for listening to the bay hq podcast today in our mission to inspire connect and guide the next generation of british asian entrepreneurs it would mean so much to us if you could subscribe to our channel, leave a review and share this with your friends.